Thank you very much. And a great message from our UN envoy on you. Jatma, thank you very much. So once again, good morning, everyone around the globe. And I hope we're all doing well. My name is Bola Ray, and I'm the CEO of EIB Network and the chairman of Empire Group Ghana. And I'm so thrilled to be your moderator for Global Citizens' sixth Global Town Hall session and lead a conversation on a topic I'm very passionate about, voices from the youth, global issues that we need to fix urgently. So we all know, out of 8 billion people in the world, half are under the age of 30. And the data shows that we have an opportunity to enhance the voices of our young people by giving them platforms like this to express their views and for our leaders to listen. And today, exactly that's what we're doing, to understand and also to take action. And I'll be speaking to great speakers as well and discussants of this. Young people should never be restricted or underrepresented. And just like Jayatma rightly mentioned, political office, we have to go in there and vote. So we should actually be the voice of representation. So before I even get started, I want to thank Global Citizen and Foreign Policy Committee of Indonesia for organizing these sessions. Very insightful indeed. And today we're joined by our speakers. Glad to mention that from Australia, we have Senator Louis Pratt, Jen on the line, you're most welcome. Excellency Sheikh Sadiq is joining. Also, Fuadi Pitswan, Shannon Chris, and V. Kati Bu for this great session uh, for the first half. So, once again, you're most welcome. And, and, and I'd like to actually start off with you, Excellency Sheikh Sadiq from Malaysia. You know, coming from your field, what challenges do you, do you face in mobilizing actions? in governance and development as a youth leader. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Syed Sadiq. Uh, I'm 30 years old. Um, I come from a lower middle income family. My father was a laborer. My mom uh, was a teacher. And I do not come from, a, from the political establishment. Uh, to be honest, uh, in a nascent democracy like Malaysia, it is very tough to rise up the political ladder unless you come from a political family or from the political establishment. But I consider myself to be privileged because at a very young age, I was given the opportunity to contest in elections. I'm very vocal. I do not uh, bow down to threats or take up uh, bribes or offers to sell my soul and dignity or short-term political gains. And I was given the opportunity uh, by my constituents today to become a two-term member of parliament uh, in Malaysia and also serving as the youngest uh, Minister of Youth and Sports uh, for two years uh, and a half and just recently re-elected into parliament uh, once more. Um, sharing that story, I want to ensure that in my country, a country which is transitioning from a developing status to a developed status, I want to ensure that young people are not just seen to be leaders of tomorrow, but also recognized as leaders of today. But saying that, um, it is important to also acknowledge the inherent disadvantages which young people in Malaysia and I believe across Southeast Asia face, especially when it comes to joining politics. The first inherent disadvantage is that uh, young people do not have the networking effect like those who are much older than us. The political establishment often rewards those uh, who come from um, political royalties, those who come from well-known established political backgrounds, or those who have had decades of experience in political parties, especially mainstream political parties, in contrast to a young activist or, or, or young passionate leader who has had years of experience in civil service or in civil societies, but wanting to shape the, the democratic landscape in the country. So that's one disadvantage, uh, which is on the lack of a networking effect. The second part, especially in nascent democracies, young people do not have the financial network and firepower like those who have had decades of experience. Uh, let's not kid ourselves, money plays a role in running for elections, especially in fundraising. Uh, and young people do not have that level of deep pocketed ties like those who have had decades of experience. The final part is that young people, the youth voting bloc is often weaker than uh, the gerontocratic uh, uh, voting bloc. Because as studies have shown, the older generation are loyal voters. They turn up 
uh, at, uh, at the ballot box more than young people. Um, and because of youth apathy, young people again are at a great disadvantage. Saying that, I, I'm more optimistic because I believe that this region, especially Southeast Asia, not Malaysia, uh, can turn a new leaf, especially as we have more and more young disruptors are uh, changing our own political landscape. I want to share an uh, uh, initiative which I championed in my country. Uh, when I served as a Minister of Youth and Sports, I realised that when it comes to shaping our country's budget for national policies, young people are always put at the back foot, especially as we are to compete uh, on who will get more allocation. Because again, uh, retirees will get more and the older generation will often get more. Then I realised, unless we are the king makers of politics, uh, we will forever be put at this disadvantage. So during my first year as a minister, I proposed three crucial constitutional amendments, which is the reduction of the voting age from 21 to 18, the reduction of um, the age of candidacy from 21 to 18, and also automatic voter registration. These three crucial constitutional am am uh, amendments will effectively enfranchise young people in Malaysia to become the largest voting bloc. So to put it into perspective, from young people uh, taking up 41% of the voting bloc in Malaysia after these three crucial constitutional amendments, you know, young people make up 55% of the voting bloc in Malaysia and therefore becoming the kingmakers in Malaysia. After we successfully, through bipartisanship, it was historic in Malaysia because after long engagements, negotiations, the diplomacy, we passed by these three constitutional amendments via bipartisanship. And after we passed it, and now young, young people are the kingmakers, I saw a radical shift in mindset and approach even among, uh, the political, uh, even among the political establishment as to how they approach young people. Now, even the political establishment are pushing more and more young candidates. Every time there's a debate about who should receive more allocations, young people are more prominently featured. When we discuss about having more young people in the decision-making process, whether it is in government-linked companies or including in private companies, we see more and more young people being included into the decision-making process after that. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that while there are inherent, uh, inherent disadvantages for young people to join politics, I think we can change that via innovative policy-making in Malaysia. It is through these three constitutional amendments. I think there will be more coming because I believe that while young people have its own sets of disadvantages, our generation are a generation of disruptors. We are innovators. We are super savvy when it comes to social media. While right. older politicians will pay millions to get your, your, your voices out, we can just get uh, an iPhone uh, uh, in front of our faces and get our message out. So in summary, I think mm. while there are disadvantages, young people must innovate, dare to think critically and out of the box to equalize the playing field and ensure that we move in as a team to shape the political landscape and the global landscape of our respective constituents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic <laughs> time. And interested in insights as well, uh, Sheikh. Thank you. I mean, great to know that you are getting to Asia, not just in Malaysia, like you already mentioned, but Southeast Asia, you know, a disruptor, I can call you and, and give you a voice and hope to you. So thank you very much. I, I'll now move on to Fuadi. Fuadi is one I want to know from you. Are we seeing a stronger or weaker idealism in youth with bodies? How much do they care about global issues? From where you sit, and you're joining us from Bangkok. Tell us more about this, uh, Fuadi. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, Fuadi Pitsuwan from the uh, Serene Pitsuwan Foundation. Uh, I had helped the uh, Pitha Limtere Lat, the leader of Move Forward Party and, and the party with uh, foreign policy formulations. But it, it's important to emphasize that whatever I say today is on personal capacity and shouldn't be linked as <laughs> thought of as an official party line. Uh, so to answer your your questions, uh, it's really complex, uh, a complex issue, and, and we really no easy answer. I, I would probably refrain from trying to categorize the youth of the present day as either having stronger or weaker idealism, because if I were to say that uh, we young people these days have stronger idealism, 
that would not do justice to to the Black May uh, 1992 movement in Thailand, which is also young people. 1998 protests in Indonesia and the various incarnation of, of, of political movement in Malaysia. So I, I would refrain from doing that. But what I uh, rather do is I, I would venture to claim that their idealism and their modus operandi are evolving to meet the complexities of our time. Uh, there are really two forces, if I have to paint a picture for you, that is a uh, trade off of each other and battling each other. On one hand, uh, ASEAN youth are more equipped than ever before to express and carry out their ideology, their idealisms. Uh, they are more exposed to global issues more than ever before. Uh, Joseph Nye has this concept uh, of power, and, and within that, he explained uh, how power diffused, uh, it, it, which is a process by which uh, the power is spread among more variety, more ra bigger range of actors, including both state and non-state. Uh, you know, with the and this is helped by uh, the rise of new technologies, the empowerment of civil society group, and this diffusion of power makes young misses uh, heard uh, even more. And, and today's youth, uh, particularly in ASEAN, you know, uh, we are more educated, more informed than ever before. We have better access to knowledge. Yeah, uh, through edu through technology. Recording in progress. Uh, through education, uh, we are more connected. Uh, through Recording media, stopped. Recording through, in progress. Uh, to internet, uh, you know, we were linked. Uh, you, you may have heard of uh, the multi alliances. Uh, we inspire each other uh, on different types of move, uh, movement. Uh, so the awareness aided by uh, social media, by technology, is a force that is pushing idealism to be manifested. Uh, at the forefront and can be seen in practice. Then you know we uh, it's really shown in different channels. It's not just on the streets, not just on written media, but also on social media and 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 new media as well. And, and people are mobilizing uh, with a much uh, easier effort uh, than before. However, with that being said, there is a force to push idealism uh, toward the forefront. But then there's also a force to suppress idealism uh, of the youth as well. Uh, issues like social inequality, unemployment rates, uh, you know, political uh, suppression, political disenfranchisement really leads to cynicism and a loss of faith and ability for young people to make a difference. Uh, they really lead to an erosion of idealism. For example, let's uh, take Thailand, for example. You know, what happened to, to Thailand, to young people? We have been disenfranchised. Uh, many, many times, and that have really strong reconciliation uh, for the future of Thailand. Young people are really asking, what is the point of going into election when our votes uh, are not honored? Uh, if the establishment moves to dissolve the, the young people, uh, a party that represents young people again, you know, we really have no idea what this would mean to the stability of the country. And reacting to this scenario, this political development, you know, some will be more active and push on uh, for their, uh, with their idealism, but then there will be a large group that gave up and you can't really blame them uh, for it. You know, there are some who choose a more secure path, who accept more secure job with big corporates uh, that, that, and the, political co the cost of political activism is, it, it will, will make a lot of people choose a safer path. So you see the force uh, being, being uh, added each other. And so at the end, uh, in summary, you know, it's really individual by individual, it, it really country by country. So you can't really conclude uh, whether it's more or less. It, it It's a case by case basis. Yep. That's what I was by It's very just in, in deep and, and, and good submission there on idealism for Adi. Thank you very much for, you know, bringing it to perspective. And clearly your point is on new media playing, you know, a, a, a stronger and a greater role in idealism. Well noted. And, and the youth now, you mentioned it. Yes, job security is key. And many of us are looking forward to uh, some questions of our minds in, in steering this. So thanks so much for bringing that perspective. But from what I deduced from what you said, we, we are urging towards a stronger idealism. And thank you for that. I'm moving on to a great, you know, brand activist. And I know, Shannon, you, you, you're keen. Yes, you have to be seen and be heard. I want to know from you, Shannon Chris. How can we ensure that the voice of the youth are heard and inclusively represented in solving global challenges? Let's look around us. How can we better accommodate youth participation in governance and development? From where you sit, what can you share with us, Shannon? 
Thank you. That's a really great question. Um, and thank you for having me. So I, I'm Shannon and I'm, I'm here from the body shop who um, Jayathma mentioned earlier, where we've partnered with the UN on this incredible campaign, Be Seen, Be Heard. Um, you know, as, as everyone has already mentioned, I'm um, rightly, uh, we have a major issue um, in that young people are chronically up unrepresented in formal decision-making spaces, whether that be business, political, civil, um, you know, and, and this is where decision is important decisions are being made about their collective future, as well as those of, of future generations. And I think Jayath Ma already mentioned the fact that only 2.6% of the parliamentarians around the world are under 30, and yet under 30, the under 30 demographic represents more than half of the population around the world. So this is an issue for a few reasons. I mean, the first thing that we really feel strongly that this means that there are barriers of fit that are preventing young people from accessing their citizen rights. Um, you know, everyone has already mentioned the fact that young people are so active. Um, you know, here in Australia, I think, you know, I, I attended the the Invasion Day marches and, and that was disproportionately represented by young people. Um, you go to any climate protest or um, rally around the world and you'll see young people um, out there and, 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 and that's wonderful to see. Um, you know, the second reason that this is an issue, however, is that, um, you know, they're missing, we're missing out on their input. You know, people have already mentioned the fact that young people are talented, they're energetic, they're optimistic, more so than the older generation. And we're really missing out on those, their valuable input. And so... I guess, you know, to get to your question, we really do need to dismantle the barriers that prevent young people from participating in these decisions that affect them uh, personally. So um, the campaign that we launched, um, and for those of you who don't know, the Body Shop, yes, uh, you might know us for selling really great beauty products like body butters and soap and, and great facial, facial theorems, et cetera. Um, but we've actually been, um, we are, represented in over 75 countries around the world. And for more than 35 years, we have been actively campaigning um, and using our stores as education hubs to talk about issues that we feel aren't necessarily given the right platform. And that dates back to our founder, the great thing, Anita Roddick, who was very much an activist in its truest sense. Um, you know, and she really felt like we had to use our, our platform as a force for good. And today we're engaging young people of all ages to really think about their roles in society. And we're calling for governments to address the barriers that prevent young people from participating in political decision-making. Even within our own business, we have a global youth collective who are advising us on important decisions, making sure that, um, you know, our campaign is, speaks to them and resonates with them. Um, and the way that that looks is, is very different in each country. So here in Australia and in New Zealand, we are working with the youth-led organizations like Make It 16 and Foundation for Young Australians um, to lower the voting age to 16. And I know that there's some great um, examples on this call where they've succeeded in, in lowering the voting age and, and that's really important. Um, in Malaysia, we, we support as a young um, organization to successfully campaign to lower the voting age to 18. Um, yeah. And um, in Singapore and Hong Kong, um, the way that we're working with young people is really to get them more involved in cl uh, climate change policy and environmental conservation in particular. So there's lots of different ways um, that, you know, young people can get involved. Um, and I think, you know, for us, we really feel that it's important for us to use our platform to to foster that. And I guess just in, in conclusion, I'd, I'd really like to say that, you know, the fact that the theme of this conference is this is our world too, that is the heart. Of, of the Be Seen, Be Hard campaign. It really sums it up. And, you know, we know that young people are here. They're active. They really care. Um, and they are tremendous leaders. And so we need to make space for them so that we can all work together uh, for a better future. And I, I'm so, so inspired by young people. And I, I'm, I'm raising two of them. And I, I, I really hope that, um, you know, they will have a much better reality um, than the one that, that, you know, young people face here. And, and, and I, I have no doubt that um, they will, because we've got amazing people. Um, a, a, much, a much better future they will have. And, and thanks so much for the good 
job that you're doing, hey. but you have to put down on. And the team and body shop, the same beard is a great campaign. So let's let's hey. give it go and let's have it everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm now moving on to another youth activist, very, very vocal. So V Katibu is joining us. V, I want to know from you, the youth is most exposed to technological advancement and, and social media. Yes, we all know. But to what degree can the youth leverage these tools to push you know, forward global agendas from where you sit? How can the youth leverage on these tools positively? Yes, that's a brilliant question and thank you so much for having me and my thoughts in this space, which is really powerful and hearing all the other speakers is incredible. And I think that young people can use social media to leverage and push forward some of the global agendas in many different ways. And we see it happening all the time. We've seen some of the biggest climate protests happen and those things going viral through social media usage. Young people can use social media to gather communities, to make their voices heard. And as we all know in this room, we're not always given the space in some of these real life um, spaces that we want to be in, where we want to sit at the table. We're not always invited. We're not always made room for. So I think social media is a great way where we make the seat and we bring the table ourselves and we let our agendas be heard. And I think that being able to gather communities and having strength in numbers is so, so powerful. And going off of that being seen, being heard, using social media as a way of advancing what we want to talk about, how we can also reach other people around the world. I think that social media is an incredible tool where in real time, I could be connecting with somebody in Indonesia while I'm all the way in Zimbabwe or someone is in the UK and we're all gathering behind a common cause. And I think that is so, so powerful. So I often see um, social media being disregarded as a powerful tool. And that really, really makes me upset because I've been able to see real change happen in real time, being able to advocate for people, being able to change lives through using social media in the right way. So I think that, you know, if there are any young people out there who care about a particular issue, young people who feel like, okay, right now, I don't yet have the participation that I want to have within government, within public offices, within the spaces where that change can happen. Social media is also still a very great tool to be able to do that. And, you know, we have one of the largest populations, largest generations of young people right now. And I think that it would be it would be a, a huge injustice to ignore that. It would be really, really wrong to not also see how social media is equipping a lot of young people with different skills that we've never seen before. It's a digital age that we're living in. And I think we've been able to see how information can be spread so quickly. You can help people advocate for their rights in real time. We've been able to see, you know, change happen overnight through using social media. So for me personally, I think it's an absolutely great tool. It's a great way to connect. It's a great way to get up to date information, you know, and I think that it has, we've seen that this year, especially during the height of the pandemic, how social media and those communities that have been created have been able to save lives in real time. So yeah, I think that um, it's, it's a great and powerful tool and I hope to see it being utilized well, more. You, 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 you said it, and what a way to put it, an incredible tool it is, you know, and, and I love what you, you said, real change in real time. And that's what social media is giving us now. And thanks so much for touting the positives and being a youth leader as well and advocates, giving us hope. I mean, the youth out there that we can go out there and be change makers as well. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll cross over to the other side of the phone. I'm going to Australia now, where we have Senator Louise Pratt standing by with Jesse. And we've had some exciting news, you know, big news from Australia, I must say, recently. First is the announcement today made at the Global Town Hall meet it regarding the asia pacific Youth leaders award to take place in early 2024 in melbourne and also which we can all apply between if you are between 18 and 30 that is so the youth out there that's a call to action from the indo-pacific region and we're also working to accomplish the sdgs you can follow the qr codes soon on the screens and learn more about this as well so this is also very historic there's a voice random out there which will take place next month and our original representation from the Australian Parliament. So we're actually going to get to Senator Louis Pratt to tell us more about this. And, and my trust in any insight as well to you, Senator, 
how do you bring this to perspective? I mean, I know you have Jesse with you as well. In all of this, what can you share with us from Australia, Senator? Well, thank you so much for having us today. Yes, I'm Senator Louise Pratt from the state of WA. I'm here with my good friend, Jesse Flay, and he is a Noongar youth leader and he was co-author of the Uluru Statement from the Heart back in 2017. Uh, and, you know, his skills as a young person, he's a terrific orator and a writer. And so he was part of bringing that statement forward to the Australian government, which brings us to have a referendum to recognise First Nations people in our constitution and to ask for a voice to parliament for First Nations people. I would note Australia is a long way behind most other like countries in its recognition of First Nations people. Um, I've personally been an activist since I was a teenager, first elected when I was 28. I spoke in my first speech in support of lowering the voting at age 2, 16, um, and I was a young lesbian and gay rights campaigner in Australia. And I've really seen things change uh, because of effective youth movement. You know, one of the skills I had as a young person was being a desktop publisher, that ancient technology, but it was new at the time. And so much as your speakers have already said about how new technology can be used, you can actually use it to gain real power uh, by, by using it within political networks and holding them to account. Um, so I'm going to introduce Jesse now. Um, we're both from Wajat Noongar country, but uh, Jesse is a Noongar man. Uh, so I recognise the country that we're on. And first of all, I'm going to ask you, Jesse, what was it like being at Uluru? Well, it's a really good question. It felt like we were really part of something even at the time. Working um, at Uluru on this document, we knew that we were making history. It wasn't just like some other committee. It wasn't like some other forum. And I've been involved in a lot of them in my time. We really meant change and we really worked together. And it was great that there was so much coherence and so much respect as we were working with our elders and listening to the voices of our elders and remembering that we were representing their struggle and their fight was very important. So tell us a little bit about the Uluru Statement of the Heart. What does it say about... Um, how does it link with the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights? Well, just quickly, the, there's that clause in the United Nations that talks about re, uh, recognising the importance of treaties and agreement made. Uh, the Uluru Statement has a calls for three basic principles, voice, treaty and truth. Uh, the voice to parliament is the referendum part we're having now because we must have a referendum to alter our constitution. And what we are doing is creating new structures in government to allow for the voice uh, of First Nations people here in Australia to be heard. Um, in the past, legislation has been made for us in very aggressive terms in the past and even recently in unfavourable terms. And governments know and respect and understand that we need to do something different in order for First Nations people to be heard. Um, everyone around the world knows that when they are part of a cultural group or, a, or any other group, um, their voice needs to be heard in order for policy to be made for them. Um, and that's exactly what we need to do with the Uluru Statement. That's so what does the statement say about uh, young people and why, and how does that link to the campaign that we're in at the moment, where we're all in the are going to need to go and vote? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure how much people are aware, but a lot of our young people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia, um, are in detention and are incarcerated in obscene numbers. And we talk about this in, in the statement. And we talk about how they should be our hope for the future. And we need to allow for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people to walk in two worlds. And what we mean by that is standing proud in their culture and their law and their tribal knowledge, and also walking and working together with businesses and organisations in an economic world so that they have a future so that they can buy All right. Well, yeah. great insights uh, once again, and, and thank you, Senator Louise Pratt and also Jessica Lee, for, for, for bringing this, you know, up there for everyone to know. And, you know, it's an expression of the Global Town Hall theme this year, and uh, which says this is our world too, and you've brought it out very well.
that the indigenous people and any other civil society as well should speak up and must have an equal voice with anybody else. You, you've done it so brilliantly and would like to say congratulations. Keep up the work and keep going on. Thank you very much. For anyone from Australia listening in, come and get involved in the campaign. Yes. Sign up okay. to CBS 23 and it'll make you... Right. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to the, the, yeah. you know, follow the, yeah, the two hour codes and the voice with random, you know, next month we wish you the very best on that. But we're moving on to our, our second round of, of, of questions as well. We have loads of questions coming in, but I want to return to uh, Excellency Speaks that they, could you share how the could contribute better in public service? You, you've done it and you're a role model. I mean, listening to your story today, I know it's a shining example for many of the youth out there who are listening and watching across over 130 countries. They'll take uh, you other uh, uh, speakers here today. As we know, it must be very challenging in a political environment to push through an agenda and idealism. How can one navigate this? Sure. I think first I think first and foremost, um, I hope young people remain participatory in democracy. My biggest fear is that youth apathy wins, uh, which effectively kills the power of young people. Uh, I know there may be skepticism uh, among young people when it comes to politics. But my advice is this, um, young people can choose to stay away from politics, but politics will never stay away from you. Effectively, you choose to stay away from politics. You are seeding the future of your country to those who are much older, who will end up voting, or will end up running as candidates, and therefore shaping a future we may, which may be directly opposite to what you want. So just because you do not turn up to vote, just because you do not turn up uh, to shape the future of your country doesn't mean that magically your country will get better. It just means that the future of your country will be shaped by those who may be in direct opposition to what you want. So if you think that politics is dirty, join it and clean it up. If you think that uh, politics uh, is truly toxic, then, detoxif then detoxify it by joining if you think that politics do not talk about policies and solutions, then join and talk about policies uh, and solutions. I, 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 love, I, love, I love that bit. So if you this is the end there and clean it up. Interesting. What a call to the to the youth out there and, and put it in perspective for us. Thank you, uh, Ashid. I would want to move on to V, and we have a question in our chat box for you from Hakim Mawanda in Uganda. And V... Hakim wants to know, how can we leverage on the social network and capital? Because it's a very big issue nowadays in Africa. How can we leverage that, V? Yes, um, I assume by saying social network, they mean the people around them, maybe who have a say in certain things. I would say that, especially if you want to utilize you know, social media alongside the social network and in real life work, get them involved, collaborate, get them or, you know, get these messages within their hands so that they can amplify it. If you can't get access to certain rooms and someone else has it, make sure that they represent you within that room. Try to get people to advocate for you. Try to get them on side to really understand why you're so passionate and why you care. This is our earth, this is our planet, it's our futures, and we should have a right in saying how that looks and how that's shaped. And if I can't sadly get in that room, I'm going to make sure someone who's in there can speak on my behalf, but also... That social media element is more powerful than you know so if you do have access to these incredible social networks get them to come to your events get them to come to your things and publicize it social media is essentially like a online portfolio of the work that you're doing and the things that you're getting involved with and people really really do want to gather behind you more than you know so if you have powerful social networks and you want to utilize them go for it 110 percent because sometimes you know we can't always be represented the way we want to but we can get someone on the side. Interesting, interesting. And you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, yes, that's what it is. And I love this session because it's given, you know, a voice to the youth out there. Voices from the youth from east, west, north, and south. And and, and we're doing just this uh, today. Global issues indeed that we need to fix urgently. I would want to now invite uh, some interventions from our discussants as well. And uh, from Sudan, we have Mayada Adil joining us. Also from Nepal, we have Ramu Pandey, so Ramu was welcome. Ashraf uh, Al Asabah is uh, joining us from Yemen. 
and also from Indonesia, we have Gita. So we'll, we'll be getting some interventions from you. I want to start off with Mayada Adil. Mayada, any question from you or some interventions? We'll welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be part of this session. It's, uh, it's, um, hello everyone. It, hello, my young tribes who's joining us today from around the world. It's my utmost pleasure to, to be here today to share my thoughts and sentiments, um, as a young leader, as a woman, as an activist, as a former doctor who lived in many countries, as a immigrant in exile, many titles. Yes. Uh, was really sensitive to the issue related to authentic integrations of immigrants, gender inequalities, health and well-being. So I would like to highlight a couple of things that belongs to my people in Sudan. Um, I, I would like to highlight the youth engagement and meaningful participation in my country, Sudan. It's important to recognize that and strengthening and support the heroic efforts of the Sudanese Youth Resistance Committee. I trust you're familiar with the crisis that's still ongoing in my country uh, in the light of the events that happened in the past six months, which is my country is going in war. These youth are performing life-saving work on, be on behalf of the state and continuing their revolutionary efforts with bravery that's beyond words. Their leadership and immense efforts has been essential in managing the humanitarian crisis that Sudanese people are going and subjected to it. And they are also pushing for peace alongside the Sudanese diaspora. We need to provide the Sudanese youth with the, our full backing and support. I call about, upon all of us, upon the international community, to deliver the life-saving supplies, including medical supplies, food, and other essentials aid to Sudanese people. Because the situation and the humanitarian situation in Sudan is disastrous and the international community cannot stand by and watch it unfold. As we have seen the the the, the inequality of the humanitarian financing system and how it's more directed to the global north more than the global south. Right. So, yes. <laughs> right. I, I think that you articulated, you know, uh, the point as very well, bringing to the fore the humanitarian situation in in Sudan, and, and a very great call. As a young activist, we we salute and we respect. What, what you're doing, and I know that you, you'll come back again with some interventions, but I want to move on to, as I thank you, move on to Ramu Pande from Nepal. Ramu, what are your perspectives as well? What do you want to say in terms of youth activism and also global issues happening around us? Your take on that, please. Uh, firstly, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Hello everyone uh, and fellow global citizens getting to Nepal and I'm Ram Pande representing uh, the youth led NGO from uh, Nepal Youth Camp. So coming from a uh, youth uh, like a uh, least developed country like Nepal uh, where there is a uh, political instability and limited resources, uh, I come across a concern uh, about inclusivity and opportunity uh, representation uh, challenges at various levels. Uh, youth are mostly taken as a uh, tokenistic uh, manner uh, in various platforms. And like, just like, uh, oh, given a platform to be heard, not heard, but just a representation kind of thing. So we in Nepal would collaborate approach uh, to make uh, youth voices to be heard, aligning their uh, initiative to the global, like local governments as well. And I do have a question as well uh, to our uh, designated uh, speakers today. As we all agree that uh, we are heading to an innovative world, but the citizens from a uh, least developed country or the land of countries still strive for uh, affordable and reliable internet connection. And with this concern, I am afraid that young people or the people from such country could be left behind. And uh, lastly, I would like to mention that let's remember that uh, our strength lies not only in identifying the problem, but being actively uh, part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rabu. Uh, you, you've actually placed it very well, that unity lies strength, and we should get together, stronger together to, to, to make an impact. I would want to now move on to Ashraf Al-Ajbahi uh, from Yemen. So Ashraf, if, if you can join us with your thoughts as well. Ashraf, 
that was affecting young people. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss critical global issues, particularly those affecting young people. As the coordinator of the Arab Youth Sustainable Development Network, I'd like to highlight the unique challenges faced by youth in the Middle East, especially in Yemen. In the Middle East, complex issues like political instability, economic inequality, social unrest, and environmental degradation demand urgent attention. Young people are disproportionately affected, and their input is vital for solutions. Yemen faces even graver challenges due to ongoing conflicts and humanitarian crises. Youths access education, health care, and economic opportunities. It's crucial that we prioritize their needs and involve them in governance and development. To address these global issues, we must ensure youth representation and decision-making at all levels. This requires platforms for dialogue and, and engagement with their initiatives. Investing in education, skills, and entrepreneurs empowers youth to become change makers. Equipping them with tools and resources enables them to tackle challenges and contribute to in conclusion, I urge policymakers, civil society, and international stakeholders to prioritize Middle Eastern youth, especially in Yemen, amplifying their voices, addressing them, and involving them in decision-making will create a more inclusive and sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ashraf. And, and increasingly, uh, there's a call to action. The youth around the world, we should get together, rise up, let's get involved and we need that youth representation which is what all the speakers and discussions are running through let's empower the youth and it's a call to governments around the world as well through education through providing skills it is very very crucial and important for all of us to just do that we'll, we'll now go uh, straight and speak to uh our, our man of course here from gita uh with our one to also come through and, and share with us uh, a message so we're ready for you gita Hi, the topic or narrative of sustainability is one of essence to the current generation and all future generations. It essentially relates to our need to attain carbon neutrality by 2050, which is only 27 years away. More simplistically, it deals with our need to take care of the planet in a good way, to make sure that we don't mortgage our future for the convenience of today. Unfortunately, it's a huge undertaking. It's expensive. It requires heavy, if not deep, economic commitments. To the extent that this particular narrative probably resonates to only a portion of the population of the planet, I would speculate that it probably resonates to no more than 15 to 20 percent of the population of the planet. Whereas on the other hand, the remaining 80 to 85% of the population of the planet, these are the guys that I think are members of the developing economies or less developed economies. I think they understand the need to attain carbon neutrality in 27 years' time, but they're much more particularly concerned with the most basic thing, and that is to put food on the table for their families. Now, this is not unique of a particular country in Africa or a particular country in Asia, but it's quite pervasive. The big developing economies of India and Indonesia, I think they're still much more concerned about being able to put food on the table. Then one begs the question, what does this mean? It means that the narrative of development just seems very different, seems much more compelling to members of the developing economies. Then what does it mean for development to take place? Or even more importantly, what does it mean for modernization to take place in many of these countries, in many parts of the world? Well, there's so many metrics that measure or define whether or not a country has developed or whether or not a country has modernized. I would simply use the metric of electrification as one means of measuring 
the modernity or the degree of modernization or development of a particular country. Electrification for countries like India or Indonesia hovers around 1,300 kilowatt hour per capita. Then what would it take for any country to be deemed modern so that they can only not only understand the meaning of the narrative of sustainability, but hopefully be able to execute what it takes to be carbon neutral. Well, the rule of thumb is you need to be electrified to the extent of around five to 6,000 kilowatt hour per capita. Then the next question comes, well, what, it would, what would it take for countries like India and Indonesia to reach electrification on a per capita per year basis from 1,300 to 6,000. Well, at the rate that they build power generation capabilities in India of 19,000 megawatts per year, Indonesia of 3,000 megawatts per year, it might take between 90 to 100 years. Then becomes apparent how irreconcilable it is between the narrative of sustainability and the narrative of development. Then if you take a look at some other developing or less developed countries in Africa, it could take more, if not much longer, much more than 100 years for them to become modern from an electrification on a per capita basis. Then begs the question, how do we actually reconcile between these two narratives? I think this is what the youth of the world needs to take a deeper look at. I think it takes at least understanding that there's this apparently irreconcilable nature between the narrative of sustainability and the narrative of development. But also more importantly, it takes open-mindedness with respect to what it would take to reconcile the two so that we can all collectively, cohesively, collaboratively achieve what needs to be achieved in 2050. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gita Wirawani, great insights from an educator, an entrepreneur, and host of Endgame. So a very popular figure right there and a former minister for trade of the Republic of Indonesia. Between 2011 and 2014, you served your country great. So thank you very much, Gita, there. I would want to now move on for some responses uh, as I invite them. I'll start with you, Fuadi. Uh, adding it, uh, you know, I want to know from you, how do we embrace more youth in, in, in leadership? Uh, and here I'm talking not just about politics, but also in other sectors. What will be your response or, or insights to this? I think I think this then will become more of a message to uh, older generations. <laughs> I think I think people who are forty plus, uh, fifty plus, sixty plus now uh, the, should be more open minded and believe that they will also once uh, young people and they should know uh, the 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 drive, uh, the passion, the ability of young people to to make change, to lead uh, as well. Uh, the cabinet just uh, came out this morning in Thailand and the majority of the cabinet members are 60 plus. I think the very few are 40 something. So, uh, but then, you know, the future of the countries are dictated by, uh, will be will be affected uh, uh, against the young people more. So at least uh, the older generations, the old guards uh, should really open doors and open this a room uh, so that we can work together so that we, uh, young people, uh, can, you know, help decide and pave our own uh, path forward, which we are the bigger stakeholder for. Yeah. We're willing to know what is going on in Thailand and having a lot of uh, me members of parliament above age 60. I hope, you know, activists like you and a lot of youth around the world, of course in Thailand, will we'll take this up and let's see a change come the next, you know, five years, the narrative will be different, having a lot more youth in parliament. But thank you for, for, for the insights and for bringing it out to the, to the world. I, I, I want to go to Shannon Brown, if you have any commentary on, on, on what we've discussed so far, responses to some of the questions that have been highlighted. Shannon? Oh, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, look, I, I think there's lots of ways that, that um, youth can be involved. And you rightly pointed out, and it's not just political. I think political participation in, from youth is very important. Um, but I think, you know, whether it's, you know, we're a business, we've created a, a youth collective, um, an advisory board that, that will advise us on decision making, um, you know, whether it's the way that we speak to young people, the way we we welcome young people in, the way that we that the culture of our business that um, that we create, um, you know, making sure that it, it's it it resonates with young people and and is diverse and inclusive and all of the things that that matters to them. Um, I think that um, you know from we we need to acknowledge that you know young people whilst they don't have as many as much lived experience um i think a lot of people here today um in particular v have have sort of mentioned that the access to technology and their use of technology far surpasses that of of my generation certainly and and i think um you know we really need to leverage that fresh thinking um and make sure that that we we listen um you know so there's I think you know if we, if we look at the informal sort of protest and and demonstration culture of the world, um, you know, young people are there. They they're the first to show up. They are on the front lines, and they're there because they care. Um, so I think really, you know, sort of enabling that passion, empowering those voices, and making sure that they're brought in wherever we can, and we we listen, um, acknowledging that we need to respect the fact that this is their world too, and and. You know, we'll be long gone uh, when when they're sort of you know cleaning up the messes that our generations have made. So I think it's important. You articulated it very well, and I know young people around the world will be excited to hear this from you, Shannon. And <laughs> certainly, we should game changes. And, and what a discussion! That is why we we keep going back to say a very big thank you to foreign policy community in Indonesia and also a global citizen for setting this up. Indeed, it's, it's a game changer. I have some messages coming in in our chat box, but before I move on to you, Shade, I want to read this from Alina from Islamabad. And Alina says, I'm curious if any of the panelists will be willing to share information and best practices regarding youth involvement in promoting good governance. This encompasses more than just participation as voters, but also their active engagement in running for elected positions and holding office. And this is from Alina in Islamabad. I think that uh, Shay, you 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 might want to take this and, and throw some more light on this. Nina from Islamabad wants to know youth involvement in promoting good governance. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, two quick points there. Number one, Alina, um, different countries have different sets of rules uh, um, in which will allow or disadvantage young people's participation into politics. But if I may recommend, from my own personal experience, start early either joining a think tank or through internships in different political offices, uh, volunteering in different political activities, uh, or disrupting uh, the political scene by setting up your own political party or by getting a group of friends to champion issues which are close to the hearts of young people. Because in the end, whether it's through a mainstream political establishment or via a new political vehicle, uh, the electorate will support those who bring a fresh, energetic voice uh, into your country's political landscape. In terms of uh, integrity and good governance, uh, my suggestion is to run a, a message which transcends uh, partisanship and political personalities. And the best way to enshrine and institutionalize good governance is to strengthen institutions because the fact of the matter is institutions transcend political personalities and parties. Parties and personalities can change. But institutions uh, remain. Therefore, I always advocate for decentralization of power, more checks and balances, more people's power institutions over personalities and partisanship. I think these are the two ways in which you could enshrine good governance for the long-term interests of our countries. Amazing, amazing uh, contributions there. I I want to go to uh, Senator, but thank you very much, Shade. I I know that Senator Louise and Jesse would want to add up to this as well encompassing you know more than just participation on voters but also active engagement as we've seen so senator if, if you're there maybe you would want to uh, come through and share some yes. insights with us australia where you have young indigenous people having a say in in, in decisions that would impact you know them 
Your take. Well, I'll let, I'll let Jesse jump in because we were, while we were muted, reflecting on Syed's um, remarks and how relevant they are. They're very relevant. Um, we were talking about how it's important to make sure that the institution reflects the basic principles of what we what we really care about as a country when those ideologies do change um, because you need to be able to hold all kinds of different people to account based on what the core principles of the state should be and one of those is making sure that people do have a voice and that they are consulted with whoever the government of the day is. And so in that context, um, one of the reasons we need this voice to parliament is that previous governments have disbanded every different version of an Indigenous voice that we have had, which is, and people are, you know, one of the debates we're having is that, oh, well, you could just create a voice, putting it in the constitution is not necessary, but it is necessary as past history has shown that uh, it has been defunded, deregistered, delegislated yeah. by successive governments every time it has existed. And just quickly, governments have controlled Aboriginal people's lives in, in the not too distant past. Uh, um, they used to put Aboriginal children on missions and um, take them away from their parents. They used to pay Aboriginal people without money. They used to pay Aboriginal people with tin meat as workers. So we're, we're, we're dealing with all of these cases now through the courts and through, um, through our proper justice processes. But this is the reason why we need to have these things in place so they don't happen again. Yeah, and with that comes uh, the storytelling part of a strong institution. Yeah. Uh, so a voice to parliament enables that identity and storytelling, which really has to also have a strong place for the voices of young people. So uh, a few tips from me. I would encourage people in different countries to follow whatever their political or parliamentary proceedings are. Um, particularly in terms of if your parliament or congress or wherever, whatever has polit parliamentary inquiries where you can make submissions and give evidence and seek to be heard there. Join political parties where there's numbers in strong, inst you know, if you've got a democratic structure in sight that you can join, then you can recruit people and gain power, gain, gain mentorship, and then you just you will build up other people's political power by joining, and then you just need to make sure you're not taken for granted in doing so. Wait, way to go indeed. Way to go indeed. And, and yeah. thank you Thanks for that. Like, credit. Thank you. And so much. You do. Yes, we'll come back to you for, for, for your closing remarks, but I want to uh, give a minute to V. To, to, to also talk to us, uh, or maybe, you know, some commentary on all that we've discussed thus far, after which I've come to every speaker to give us your closing remarks and possibly a quote or a message for the youth out there. So I, I, I start off with you, V. Um, I think that today's event and many events that have taken place in the past year or two years have shown just how powerful the voice of youth is, how we really are the future, we are change makers, and that we deserve to be seen and being heard. I mean, I really love that campaign that the Body Shop is running because it's so important and it's so true. Like start giving space to young people, start giving them meaningful engagement, meaningful participation. Don't just, you know, invite us to things just so we can be present. Also invite us in the moments of implementation, the moment of giving our ideas, you know, and start really advocating and supporting our work by bringing us and creating a seat at the table. It's not good enough anymore to just say, this is how things have been and this is how they'll always be. You can make change. You can be a voice in those spaces that you have power to say, hey, if we're going to be discussing young people, maybe we should talk to young people. Youth are the future and we deserve to be heard. That's, that's, that's right, then. This is refreshing indeed. And, and, and considering that it's 4 a.m. getting to 5 a.m. where you are, I love the energy. So thank you for being so passionate and, and coming out to, you know, talk to the youth out there. I would want to go to uh, Yemen once again and speak to the program coordinator for the Arab Youth Sustainable Development Network. Ashraf, I would want to take a sentence from you as we wrap it all up. And I'll, I'll give our, our speakers the chance to do so as well. But with you, Ashraf, your closing remarks and uh, in a sentence to you, what would that be?
Ashraf, are, are you there? If, if Ashraf is getting uh, things together, I, I, I think that I'll, I'll cross over to Fwadi for your closing remarks. And of course, in a sentence, what do you have for the youth out there? Uh, yes, I think uh, probably echo a lot of uh, uh, issues and comments that every other uh, person have, have, have talked about. Uh, I, I want to showcase uh, there are really two things, right? Uh, one, uh, we have been talking about uh, young people, uh, you know, uh, getting internship, getting engaged, join political party, becoming active, uh, don't give up. Uh, that's the push factor, right? But then there is also a pull factor that really needs help that I have talked about is the adult. Uh, if, if there are people listening to this, is to give more chance, more opening, more room, more space for young people to to be able to showcase their ability. Uh, so it's really the two two system that that have to work together. Uh, uh, one will not work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll go to Mayada Adil uh, from Sudan. One sentence, please. One sentence, Mayada. Try. I'm gonna try. It's so hard. <laughs> Well, I think I'll start it with a quote. Um, I no longer accept the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things that I cannot accept. That's how Angela Davis said it affirmatively. Here and now. That, and, that, and that is it. That is it for us. It, 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 it's situated. So thank you very much. Have to wrap it up. Here and now, I cannot be sure as Angela, but like I'm proud to belong to a young generation who's willing to use right. every possible tools and skills they have to dialogue, to participate, to contribute, to breaking down the walls of power. Well, well said, well said. We get your message. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mayada. If, if Ramu is there, Ramu Pandey, in one sentence, please, as we wrap up. Thank you so much for uh, this wonderful dialogue. So the one sentence will be, uh, I believe that uh, you should be uh, capacitated with different skills so that they can leverage their ability to be participated in different platforms. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, on this note, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all of you speakers and discussants for joining us. And a big thank you to Global Citizen, to FBCI. Yes, thank you very much for providing this platform for us, foreign policy, you know, community in Indonesia. Clearly, the world is spooky from the perspective of the youth and interesting insights as well. For me, my quote will be, it is possible. Let's go out there as the youth of the world. Let's have a voice. Let's give hope. And let's go out there and be change makers. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the session. Enjoy the rest of the day. My name is Bola Ray once again. And it's been interesting coming your way. Have a lovely time. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.